Hi, and welcome to another short course on workforce planning. Um, this session is about modeling and it's part of course B, which is the uh, workforce redesign approach we use called Wrapped Redesign. Uh, if you haven't seen um, sessions uh, naught uh, to, to three, uh, then I thoroughly recommend you go back and have a look at those before we get into modeling. But if you're just interesting in interested in some thoughts, on workforce modelling, then this is the place for you. I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Colin Lurie. I run Carados Limited, which is a management training and development company, which is focused at the moment primarily on workforce planning because of how important it is, but we also train in cost control, um, in customer service and in general management skills. We focus on providing tools um, and techniques uh, for free and then assisting people to use them uh, supporting them through um, through projects and this course is part of that um, provision of free stuff. Um, we also work with Lancashire and South Cumbria to provide more free stuff uh, and with Health Education England to provide and support the RAPT tool um, and these lovely people are the RAPT team. Um, you have there in the middle Fiona and Amina on the right and they are uh, an NHS based training and development service. They're commissioned by HEE um, and they deliver the wrapped tool in partnership with Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust and the local uh, ICS. Um, they maintain wrapped itself, which is a free to use online secure workforce modeling tool that can be used for um, creating baselines and it can be used for modeling. And whilst I won't be specifically talking about um, uh, wrapped modeling in this course, you'll find it as an extra course or set of courses that uh, Amina and Fiona deliver and will um, put on this channel uh, pretty soon. The approach we all take to development is a bit like this. So we're all happy to provide the tools and techniques in this course for free. Knock yourself out if you're willing to sit through uh, my uh, somewhat uh, monotone voice and the uh, lots of blue that you seem to get on these courses, um, blue boxes especially. This course has lots of dark blue boxes to break up the monotony of the light blue boxes. Um, we deliver uh, tools and techniques, though, only as part of what you need to provide, which is about making sure you have the capacity um, and the capability to be able to do this work. And by capacity, we mean the time and capability, the support to be able to do that in terms of um, uh, in terms of access to people who have done this sort of stuff before um, and, and or are going through it at the moment and you can therefore talk to. Um, key element is to make sure that you are embedded though in your organization so you need to make sure that whatever you're doing and the time you're taking is actually solving a problem for your organization uh, and part of that is making sure you are delivering a project which gives you a reason to learn a chance to practice and something to prove success uh, with um, there is no substitute for actually using this stuff to deliver a real project um, and we are around um, in the rap team um, to support you with projects that you might need to undertake. Um, this module, um, we are talking about modeling. Uh, it's part of the workforce redesign course, which is one of the courses we offer. Uh, from a workforce planning point of view, you'll find on this channel uh, an overview on what, what workforce planning is. You will also uh, or soon find stuff on how to use the wrapped tool, as I talked about. We'll also talk about how to develop a workforce plan in a course, uh, which is course C. And course D in the workforce arena is uh, the features of a workforce hub. Finally, course E will be some thoughts on workforce planning at the front line, uh, stuff like rostering and the like. Um, but this is how to redesign workforce. You've already seen courses on how, uh, on the high level redesign process, on the scope and mobilization uh, stage, on understanding the current state and the future state. And there will soon be, in fact, I'll be recording it straight after this one on planning and implementing the change. But we're here to talk about modeling the workforce and we will cover an overview, basic modeling, advanced modeling, types of model and wrapped. Uh, we'll do it at a fairly high level um, because as far as the approach is concerned, um, it's more about uh, hopefully using the wrapped tool as part of this work, uh, which will be a separate course on. Um, but of course, many of you will like to use things like Excel to develop your own models. Uh, and so this course is about providing a few pointers on that. Just go through overall what the wrapped process is. As we said, the model future state is sitting there with its tiny two steps, uh, which is about modeling the options and validating the options. As I say, we can add some more steps to that if we don't want to use wrapped, um, such as designing and building it and testing it. Um, but at the moment it sits there. 
Um, and don't forget, modeling can be used at any stage in this. This is why we show it as a circle and a set of circles. So at mobilization stage, you want to be thinking about, you want to be designing your model really there and deciding which type you're going to use. And um, we'll talk about the different types in a bit. When you're in the current state, you need to collect the information that you need um, in order to populate the model. So it's important at the current state time. And from a future state point, you need to be able to develop your options, which need to go in the model as well. Um, so, and you can also use um, Wrapped itself as part of the future state. You can show the current state on there and show the impact of changes. So it's important. Modeling is also important in the modeling stage, obviously. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and in implementation, the model can be used as part of the documentation and it can be used to drive a business case, um, especially if you want to think about costs. So, um, but for the sake of this, we show this as a, uh, as a linear process um, going around the circles. Um, but as I say, you can jump around. So this is relevant to all different areas. Modeling the future state fits here in the process. Uh, and you can see below uh, wrapped modeling will be a course. I think it's X5 is the actual name of the course which will soon be um, up as well, so you can see how it works. But at the moment, uh, I'm going to talk about modeling the future state at a, at a high level. Okay, so on with it. Um, this is the overview section, but it's pretty much the whole section. This won't be a long course. So uh, in Wrapped, we have two steps, as I say. We have model the options and we have validate the options. But in um, if you're going to do a bespoke model, you do need to think about a few other steps as well that you need to think through. So you've got design, build, and test. Now, obviously, in the design stage, this happens at the start. Um, the way it works will adapt through the various parts of the program, um, but the reality is, is that at the start, you ought to have a bit of a design. Um, so you need to understand the data that you're going to use. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, we need to think about what outcomes you want. Uh, and you need to think about what analysis is required to drive the change. So when it comes to advanced modeling later or simple modeling later, we'll need to think about do we want to use activity information, for example, as part of it? Do we want to model changes in activity information in order to drive the changes in workforce information? Or do, you, do we just want a very simple final uh, bit of activity information to drive the change? Um, we might need to think about is this going to be a, a model which needs to operate across multiple wards or multiple care homes? Uh, and if so, um, the design of the model will need to be different for that there. So right at the start, we need to understand what we want and design our model. And then we need to build our model. Now, building a model is uh, not something I'm going to be able to teach. I'm not going to be able to teach you your basic Excel skills through this course. Um, building a model is, uh, is a complicated step, um, but in reality, it is steadily building up um, Excel uh, uh, Excel or Tableau or whatever else other tool you want to use into developing the model. There are a few things to consider when building a model and a few things that I always consider and I will at some point on this channel run through a model that um, that I've created to show you or a couple of different models to show you some different ones. But from a, um, from a build point of view it's always worth thinking about um, the fact that other people might want to use this so um, annotating the model is worth thinking about. It's always worth using different color cells for input, for calculation and for output cells um, because you want to make sure it's quite clear where people should be putting their data and where they shouldn't be putting their data and you should be protecting those cells that are not used for entry to avoid the risk of people making mistakes or breaking the spreadsheet through, um, through introducing new columns. Um, I have developed models before where people have added uh, functionality in white text to confuse me as to where it is. So. Um, it is well worth making sure everything's protected. Um, you want to make sure that um, entry cells will only allow the correct format of entry so it doesn't break your model. Um, and you need to consider whether you want to use complex calculations, um, which uh, in, a, in an individual cell, which can be um, difficult to audit, but come and look quite cool. Um, or do you want to build those um, calculations up over a number of cells so that people can see you're working out um, but there are more opportunities for that to be broken uh, and it looks less uh, flash. Um, there's a whole host of different things you need to think about from a building a model point of view, um, which we won't go into a huge amount of detail in here um, because it will depend on what tool you're using to, um, to develop it. Um, 
we'll talk about modeling in a second, uh, but the testing the model is a vital step. To be honest, even with wrapped, you ought to test it just in case there is um, an issue of snuck in there, but it's been extensively tested. So I'm kind of hoping there aren't any issues, um, but it is always worth doing a bit of light checking, even with generic packages. Um, with, um, with bespoke packages, um, so sorry, with the generic ones like Excel and Tableau and the like, which you've designed, then uh, errors are far more likely. So therefore you really need to test. If you're testing, you really ought to do some self-testing and get somebody else to do some testing from a peer testing point of view, and then get some user testing and sign off. And really what you want is, you want to document uh, what you're expecting to happen. You want to um, document what has actually happened and any differences and any changes you've made. Uh, and you want to make sure that this stuff is recorded and that there is sign off at each of these stages to make sure that it has been um, it has been done. So we're going to get into modeling in a bit more. Um, I'll briefly talk about validating the options here as well, though. So validate the options with um, stakeholders is a key step. So when you've modeled it, validate what you found, check it in with the um, check it in with the, the stakeholders, as we always say with these things to make sure it meets what they require. And then you can go back and do some remodeling. So an overview, uh, that's what uh, modeling is. Now, there are um, different bits of modeling we can talk about, but let's talk about basic modeling. What's the absolute bar minimum you need for modeling if you are going to build a workforce model? Well, for me, it's three things. It is workforce, it's activity, and it's drivers. And this is exactly what um, is put into wrapped, again, the bare minimum. Um, you want to make sure you've got workforce information, which is... Um, you need a unique type, um, so you need to have some sort of view on the role description or whatever it is, so you can determine between different um, between different uh, uh, people. You need to have numbers, so you need to know how many there are, which you can uh, use. Uh, typically, we use whole time equivalents. Um, you can add full time equivalents as well, as in uh, so you can add uh, headcount in there as well if you want to. But WTE or FTE, how much of a person is involved in the work? So you need the, the workforce and you need the activity information, um, which needs to be broken down into types and the number of each activity. So basically you've got 20 nurses and five uh, care home administrators doing 20,000 contacts, uh, contacts and 40,000 bed nights, for example. Um, so those are the sort of key bits. We covered this in data. Um, I'm pretty sure you've got this already. Um, then you've got the drivers. Um, the drivers are what connects the workforce and activity, as we've already learned a couple of times. Um, now, that's a link between the two. And there are various different ways of linking it between the two, though. Um, the wrapped tool uses what we call a percentage model. Uh, there are also other approaches, which I'll talk about in a second. From a basic modeling point of view, all you really want to know, or know are the things on the right hand side. So basically, what you want to know is what's the impact on activity if the workforce drops. So if activity drops, um, sorry, if workforce drops, so if you end up with fewer workforce as a result of natural attrition, what will be the impact on the activity that can be delivered? That's always a good start. So you generally want to be able to do that. You also want to, want to be able to impact what would be the impact of changes in efficiency. Now, this is where it gets a bit complicated because you've got two different uh, ways you can look at this. What is the impact on activity that we can do with the team if efficiency improves or gets worse. So assuming efficiency tends to get better, if efficiency doubles, what's the impact on the activity? Okay, uh, one would assume the activity doubles, uh, but you need to be able to see that. Uh, but the flip side of that could be um, not just what activity can we do with the team, but what would the impact be on the workforce? Because we might say, oh yes, we're twice as efficient, which means we can do twice as much work, or we can say we're twice as efficient which means that we need half the people. Um, and so you want to be able to model that as well. Finally, what you want to be able to impact is um, what is the impact on workforce if activity changes? So again, if activity goes up, what's the impact on workforce? Um, specific activities go up, what's the impact on workforce? Those are the sort of bits of basic modeling you tend to need to be able to do. And I've added their cost of options because it tends to be helpful, um, but a key thing, adding in some costs for each of the workforce so you can show the difference in cost is often valuable. Um, you're going to need to model that somewhere, be that a calculation off the model or in the model. So you want to put that in there somewhere. 
You're also going to want to be able to show three different things. Realistically, you're going to want to be able to show what is the current state. So what does it look like at the moment? What's the current costs? What's the current team? What's the current activity? And how is it currently split? You're going to want to be able to show the future staffing. So what is the uh, workforce, the activity, and the um, split between those workforce uh, and costs? Uh, and you're going to want to be able to show what the changes are because the changes are needed in order to drive the implementation um, and to make it obvious to everybody what uh, changes are being signed up to. And when it comes to the future staffing model, because all good things come in threes by the looks of it, you need, um, you'll need a few different options for future staffing. Um, obviously, you've got the current state, which is one. Um, so you could say, theoretically, um, we're trying to keep things um, as they are. But keeping things as they are is not the same as do nothing because things will change. Activity will change. Efficiency may change. Workforce will almost certainly change with turnover. And the longer the um, process goes on, the longer um, the longer the, the time scale is, the, the longer this is likely to be. So you may end up with people retiring. Uh, you may end up with turnover. You may end up with people coming in through training, which is already set, for example. Um, so there needs to be a do nothing option, which means if we do not transform, then we may not have um, the same number of staff as we had at the time, and therefore that will have an impact on activity, for example. The third thing we'll have, it could be many things, which are other options, and these are the things which are um, really what we talked about in the future state. So we may have uh, multiple other options with various levels of agreement or various level of changes due to redesign, um, but we will need other options which represent a future we're aiming for. Um, so this will be a very different picture. So basic modeling, workforce activity drivers, current state changes, future state, uh, and those impacts um, is really what we're talking about from a basic modeling point of view. Now, Wrapped can do all this. So Wrapped was designed to be able to do all this, and um, you can do this in Excel if you want, um, but Wrapped is there available to be used if you want to have a learn of how that works. So Wrapped was designed to do basic modeling. It's still pretty complex when you get to lots of teams, um, if you've got, uh, if you're working across a system and you've got 30 different teams, then this is not easily done in Excel. Um, and certainly the, um, the, the wrapped tool, um, will help you with this stuff. And I'll talk about wrapped again at the end, but you might want to do some advanced modeling that wrapped can't easily do. That doesn't mean to say it can't do this at all. Um, but it's not in its basic kind of, um, basic form. So I, who um, helped design the wrapped tool uh, years ago, will also do some fairly advanced modeling in Excel. Uh, and I grew up using Excel and Lotus 1, 2, 3, for those of you that remember um, Lotus. Um, they were very similar packages. Uh, Lotus, I think, was better, but hey. Um, advanced modeling can re be required for all sorts of different reasons. The big one that I use Excel for is activity modeling. Uh, so Wrapped was designed based on teams. Activity um, really is based around the patient. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, in other courses or have done about activity and, um, uh, and demand being slightly different. But activity is the big one. Now, there is an approach called CLEAR, which we talked about, which is the clinically led workforce redesign education program. Uh, run by 33N and HEE, and that uses activity really well. Its bespoke models create Sankey diagrams, which show the flow of people from GPs into different parts of the system and out the other side. Activity um, can be, if used interactively, can really engage clinicians um, in changes, but it can also uh, be used for great modeling purposes to say, you know, we might have contacts in wrapped that says, you know, contacts up or down, but what makes up those contacts? Um, what's complex? What's simple? Um, we can have a look at what are the things that make up those contacts, put in DNA rates and stuff like that to really, uh, which we'll talk about in a second actually, but you can use those and play with those individual bits to make sure that um, you can show activity. You don't need any more than we talked about in the basic modeling and you can actually do some fairly um, more detailed activity work in Wrapped. Um, but one of the reasons why I will sometimes create a bespoke model will be to really show activity in the link to workforce um, in more detail. Um, we might also want to look at the impact of factors on retirement, which we used to do a lot using um, age and gender because there used to be more defined rules and more people would retire at certain points. Thanks to some uh, rather crazy changes to um, 
uh, to retirement financing and to some rather more sensible approaches to um, gender equality um, and uh, lack of ageism, uh, it's very difficult to work out when people are going to retire. And I would typically just use national uh, statistics to tell me how many people are likely to retire in my team if I'm looking at things over time. But if you want to model uh, in some complex way things like um, age, then um, that is typically done uh, outside of uh, a simple model like wrapped. Um, I say I'm not sure it's a great example these days, but um, it is something you might want to do. You might also want to m model different factors like travel times for care visits. You might want to impact. Uh, might want to model the impact of single occupancy wards. Um, what you can end up is some quite complicated um, modelling based around different factors for different wards, different factors for different care homes. Um, and you might want to model that in a complex manner, which is more difficult in, um, in, in bespoke models to do. So that's a good one. Uh, you might also want to overlay benchmarks, which Wrapped used to do, and we took it out because um, no one was using it, and basically all benchmarks are evil as far as I'm concerned. But um, you might want to overlay benchmarks on it. You might want to overlay what others are doing in a multi-care um, home model. You know, can I be the top quartile performance, uh, that sort of thing. Um, if you want to do that, again, that sort of thing is done outside of a bespoke model. Safer staffing and base staffing. Um, I mean, base staffing is there to make this a nice eight blocks, but they're very similar things. Safer staffing is you might want to overlay and you should overlay some sort of safer staffing level uh, model onto things. Um, sometimes it will say you, you need a certain number of nurses, you see, need a certain number of staff in a care home or whatever, um, even if the flow of... Um, uh, yeah, even if the, the activities don't require it, inverted commas, you might want to overlay a st safer staffing level to make sure it doesn't drop below it. Or a base staffing level. Um, I used to work in retail where it was really difficult to work out. Um, uh, some, some card shops I worked in, for example, um, they might not have any people in at all if it was a quiet part of the year and there weren't any, any big stuff going on. They might have two or three people looking for birthday cards, whereas if it was Valentine's Day, they'd be rushed off their feet. Um, even if it's a quiet day, you can't have nobody in the shop. People might come in. So you need a certain number of base staffing, at least one person. You might need to double person that shop because it's in a dangerous area. So therefore, you need to make sure you've got two staff members on or you might need it for, for rotor purposes. So again, you might want to program that in. It's really tough to program that in even in Excel, but you might want to do it offline. Uh, if you want to, knock yourself out. I tend to just model it and use it as, a, uh, as a, um, uh, an assumption in my model. One of the reasons why I do use a model quite a lot is to record each step. So sometimes I just like to record every single step that people take so that when we're doing redesign work, I can say, well, what if we took that step out? Uh, I want to record the time of each one of those steps. And I'd say, what if we change the time on that? Technically, you can do that in Wrapped. I find it a lot easier to do it in Excel. And the same with efficiencies. If I want to show changes in DNA, etc., then I'll do that. Um, that's why DNA rates um, or changes in other things um, as well as the step. Uh, changing um, the impact, for example, of um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example now beyond DNA rates, which is a great example. Um, changing, for example, a um, uh, the any other changes we might make, which are beyond changes to steps. For example, if we added a uh, a nearer room, for example, which might improve efficiency, uh, nearer stock room, for example, um, or if we um, had a nightingale ward rather than single single um, occupancy rooms those things are difficult things to um, model in a bespoke model so you might want to show those here dna rates are the main reason i do it which is why i was struggling to find any other examples um so modeling advanced modeling might be needed um so you might not want to just use wrapped you might want to do some advanced modeling and so those are the different reasons I talk about three types of model. I know this is a generic model, but there are three types of model. The example there is for a percentage model. So it's percentage, a bottom-up, and a multi-team. Those are the three ones I want to talk about. Briefly, what are they? Percentage is how um, wrapped works. A percentage model is one where um, you work out how many people are doing how many activities and what percentage of their time they are spending between those activities. I'll explain that in a bit more in a second. A bottom up is where you work out all the tasks people do and how long they are, add them all up and say that's how many people I use. 
And a multi-team one is a slightly different one entirely, which is where you have, um, it's a version of generally the bottom-up activity model. But what you do is you develop a standard model and then you apply that to multiple different uh, wards or care homes or whatever else and you apply factors to those care homes. I did this a lot in retail um, and when I did that in retail I uh, had to look at all sorts of different models. I'm just checking I need to speak about this here. So um, I'll talk about multi-team first before then going into the two more simple ones. A multi-team one, when I was in retail there were lots of things that had an impact on how many people you needed. You um, you couldn't just say, right, this is the uh, overall number of sales you've got in that shop. So this is how many people you need. It didn't work like that. Uh, it's a good start, uh, but it didn't work like that. There were all sorts of different things. Um, different items can take longer to sell than others. If you wanted to um, convince someone to buy the right TV, that was very different to selling somebody a kettle at the till. And it required different staff, for example. So you need to break down the types of sales per um, staff. So we've already got you know, sales per, per branch, and then you've got the different types of sales. If you've got multiple floors, that has an impact on security, so you need more people. If you've got um, a stock room, which in some cases might be right next to the shop, in other cases might be up a long flight of dangerous stairs, in other cases in shopping centers, it might be in a different building. That has an impact on restocking. Um, customers, um, can come in various different uh, patterns uh, of, uh, of uh, arrival, which can have an impact on things. So if you're right next to a bus station, for example, then people tend to come in um, large groups, um, which is harder to manage than people that come in a static pattern. So, um, And then also things like time in service um, can sometimes change how many holidays people have got. Um, uh, maternity leaves and stuff like that, you might want to apply um, uh, very specific percentages depending on how many staff you've got on maternity. I've never been a big fan in wards where you apply a standard percentage for maternity. I don't like that. I like places like in uh, some of the Shrewsbury Trusts where um, they, uh, one of the Shrewsbury Trusts, sorry, where they um, uh, apply a, a variable percentage for maternity leave based on how many people you've actually got on maternity um, because that's better. You can do the same for sickness theoretically, uh, although there's different schools of thought around that. So a multi-team model is one where you'd operate across multiple uh, different um, uh, wards, care homes, branches, uh, whatever you want to look at across. Let's look at the difference between percentage and bottom up. Um, the reason why I like the percentage model is not one I've used for most of my career. It's only been the last seven years working with RAPT that we've used the percentage model and I do like it. If you look at that beautiful table in blue, you'll notice that we have 5,000 reviews and 5,000 treatments and that a social worker, we've got five of them, five caseworkers and two administrators doing those 5,000 reviews and 5,000 treatments. You can show it as um, the social worker there is doing 50% uh, of their time on reviews and 50% of their time on treatments, which adds up to 100. A caseworker is spending 50% of their time doing reviews. 50% of their time is fixed, um, which gives you 100% of your time. Um, so essentially five caseworkers are doing 2,500 reviews uh, sorry, doing 5,000 reviews, but they're doing it with half of their time. Um, and you've got two administrators that are doing, um, they're spending all of their time on treatments. Um, so in general, we know we have captured everybody. We've got five social workers, we've got five case workers, and we've got two administrators, and they are doing 5,000 reviews, 5,000 treatments, and they are also doing two and a half case workers worth of fixed tasks. Um, which may or may not be uh, attributed to those, um, uh, will be attributed basically to both reviews and treatments uh, in any particular model or to reviews, depending on uh, where the percentage are, in this case, uh, applied entirely to reviews. We could have just put them all 100% on reviews and said the fixed is part of that time, um, but I won't get into too much detail on fixed uh, and variable at the minute. What we need to know is that we have captured the total amount of staff, the total amount of work that's being done, um, and so that's what it is. So if uh, uh, treatments double, we know that we are gonna need more social workers and more administrators, but we're not gonna need any more case workers, for example. So that is how, uh, that's an example of drivers, that's an example of activity and an example of, um, of staff right there. Um, so if it was very, very simple, we might have said, we've got um, social workers, case workers, administrators, we've got reviews and treatments. If, if treatments double, we double the staff. But we know now by using drivers that we don't double the staff. We increase the number of social workers. 
we double the number of administrators, but we don't touch the number of caseworkers. Now, I like the percentage model because it is accurate. You do need to add in and make sure we're clear on how many staff are delivering it. So we do need to make sure we include bank and agency. But we do know that that many staff did, in real life, deliver that many reviews and treatments last year, as long as the activity is right. What we don't know is how efficiently they did it. So they could have been taking lots of breaks doing it. They could have been worked uh, beyond their um, capacity for reasonable thought, which is probably more likely to deliver that. Um, actually, in reality, it's probably more likely they've done both. They were quiet in some periods and really busy in others. Um, that's the reality of any job, uh, but certainly um, one of the realities of healthcare at the moment um, is certainly some of those peaks are incredibly difficult. So we don't know any of that detail, but we do know they delivered it. So we're not likely to make any big mistakes, which are likely to put more pressure on the staff, unlike the bottom-up model where we may well do. So the way a bottom-up model works is you list all the actions that you've got. So in this particular case for, I'm just doing this for treatments, we uh, see a patient, we actually do the actual treating of a patient, uh, or a person in this case, and we administrate uh, that person. We can break that down into 50 different steps of the administration can be broken down in all the steps of administration, but this is sort of a simple example. And we say, oh, it takes 30 minutes to see a patient and a social worker does that. It takes 15 minutes to treat a patient and a social worker does that. It takes 27 minutes to administrate a patient and an administrator does that. We can times 15 by 5,000 and we can get 1.9 uh, social workers across the year. We can times 27 by 5,000 and we can say, 1.5 actually we're times we're times in 45 by 5,000 both of those added together give us 1.9 and we are adding 27 multiplying 27 by 5,000 will give us 1.5 administrators um, fairly simple calculation 27 times 5,000 divided by 37.5 times 52 um, which means that we need technically that many people the problem is is that we need more than that those people because it's not just this that they are doing they are doing lots of other things. They are going on holiday. They are having sickness uh, for a start. They're on maternity leave. So you've got that on cost percentage that you need to make sure you apply. But also what they're doing is they are going to have inaccuracies. They're going to move between tasks. They're going to take breaks. Um, they're going to nip to the loo, um, etc. And that is what we call downtime. Now, I've talked about downtime before, I think, in this course, but downtime is a dangerous concept because it's difficult to know exactly how much it is. Um, a great way of working out downtime is to do both a bottom-up and a top-down model or a percentage model, bottom-up, and work out where the differences are. So when we've done all the calculations and we've added the holiday sickness and everything else, we're left with a difference between um, the time it takes to do each task versus the percentage, chance, the percentage time taken on each course on each task uh, overall sorry we find a difference of um, you know, a whole time equivalent um, or 20 percent of the time or 30 percent of the time that is the current downtime percentage now we can work on that we can try and understand why it's so high or in you know, 30 percent actually not that high uh, we can try and understand why it is what it is um, but in reality you are going to have some downtime i used to spend my life going around after another management consultancy redoing um uh, models where they hadn't taken into account downtime and therefore suggesting 30% staff reductions across shops um, uh, and that is not safe because people need that time it is a key part of what they do so a bottom-up model can be dangerous but the great thing about it is you can model individual changes so you can say what if I change the administration time what if we introduce a system that reduces the time by five minutes what will the impact be and you can show that in the model uh, and I will show you a bottom-up model example uh, in uh, one of the example courses. So um, these are all useful things to think about, but you've got those three different types of model, percentage, bottom up and multi-team. So pretty much there at this point, I just want to talk finally about wrapped and just be clear, which is why I've got the wrapped logo in the center of the screen and wrapped in the top left hand corner and the bottom right hand corner just for emphasis. So wrapped is the workforce repository and planning tool. It is a... Um, free online tool that is available to be used um, uh, available at the moment uh, the wrapped team can give you access to that uh, and on just a few seconds time we'll get on to that part of it the wrapped tool is worth learning 
um, if you want to do uh, modeling in teams without playing with Excel and without all those things I've talked about, without having to go through all of that stuff I've just talked about in terms of developing an Excel model. If you can't use Excel, if you want other people to use this model, if you want to share this model, if you want to make sure the information governance is safer um, because you uh, can't have the same level of security over Excel as you can over Wrapped, if you want to be able to share tools with other people um, safely, um, then Wrapped is the tool to use. Uh, and as I say, the courses will be available on how to use that. Uh, and you can get training on that from um, the Wrapped team as well as training on this whole uh, approach to workforce redesign. So that's all I want to talk about modeling. Modeling in itself, I barely scratched the surface, I think, um, but I'm not going to teach you how to build models from scratch in Excel. Uh, as I say, I will show you an example at some point um, when I get onto the example courses, but I wanted to get this one recorded. Um, and as I say, look at the wrapped courses. Your next steps could be, you could register to the wrap tool. Um, there you go, there's the link I promised you right at the start. You could uh, buy the bumper book of health and care workforce planning, which takes you through all sorts of different things, including planning uh, hubs, frontline uh, skills, as well as the full redesign approach. Um, and you have it in a beautiful little A5 book. Um, that is now fully written and will be available on Amazon by the end of June. Um, just waiting for uh, someone prestigious to write the forward. Um, you could visit the RAP website, you could visit the Carados website, uh, and you can visit the Health Education England workforce planning pages, um, all of which are uh, cool, groovy ways of getting access to uh, stuff. Um, you can also get in touch with me via the Carados website uh, and I'll help answer questions. Um, you could continue the RAP redesign course at implementation, which is session B5, um, or you can have a look at some of the much shorter courses on uh, Wrapped Plan, Wrapped Hub, and Wrapped Frontline. We call them courses, but they're pretty much one session each. Um, but that's really helpful if you want to build a workforce plan, uh, especially for a system. If you want to build um, a hub, uh, meet the requirements of the SWIM model, um, that sort of thing. Uh, or if you're a frontline manager and just want to understand some of the other skills you might need alongside redesign. That is it. I hope that has been useful. Uh, join us uh, for the implementation, uh, the final stage of Raptree design um, after this. Cheers.